28 followers. Must be working. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our wonderful panel. Um, we're very excited to, to have this illustrious group of very phenomenal artists and philosophers, advisors and professors with us today. And the title of our presentation is The Arts, Contemporary Art Reimagined. I'd like to give a brief description of the title and the content of our talk today, and then we'll hand over the questions to our five remarkable panelists. So what are we going to talk about over the next 45 minutes? This is the topic. New forms of artistic expression develop constantly, some today as a cultural response to the pandemic and others in reaction to the environmental conditions in the world. Artists throughout history are avant-garde communicators of society's most pressing issues and its evolution. How do visual artists and art institutions define the new era post-contemporary? Could it be called and what does it mean? To answer these questions, we are going to hear from Janet Ettelman, who's a sculptor and fiber artist from the United States, and Nick Gentry, an artist in the UK, Sundi Mlengaya, excuse my expression of uh, pronunciation of your name, in Tanzania, Julian Salabras, professor at the Courtaud Institute of Art in London, and Alejandro Valega, professor of philosophy at the University of Oregon, United States. And I am Judy Holm, the moderator. I'm the founder of a program called the Global Fine Art Awards, and also launching a new project called Platform Planet Earth. So welcome to our guests, and a huge thanks on behalf of Horaces to our five wonderful speakers. Uh, first, I would like each of the, our panelists to take a minute or so and, and present their short bio of their very illustrious career. So Nick, could we start with you, please? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm an artist from London. Um, I predominantly reuse um, technological waste in my work, so obsolete materials. Um, mostly portrait painting, um, and I've had shows in, in the UK, Europe, and USA. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about these topics. Thank you, Nick. And Julian? Hi. Um, I teach art history at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London, uh, especially focusing on documentary forms, the history of photography. Uh, new media and globalization. Uh, last year, my uh, very much updated contemporary art, uh, very short introduction appeared, and also my book on war and photography, also filling for show. I've also been writing about the relations between cultural and political populism in contemporary art. I'm not sure we're hearing everyone's sound. Okay, is everyone okay? Okay. Sungi, could we hear um, a little bit about your background, please? Could others be on mute when you're not speaking so that we don't get reverb? Hi, I'm uh, Sungi Mlinga from uh, Tanzania. I'm a visual artist. Um, I paint a lot of figurative work. Um, I focus on women. I paint a lot of men um, against uh, stark white backgrounds. And um, yeah, I'm a fairly new painter. Um, art is, an, is still a new career and um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Janet, let's, uh, let's hear about your wonderful background, please. Um. I began as a painter, but um, my work has grown to bring these things that I used to paint into physical reality in the world. And this is just the scale. This is one of the works that brings people together. It's important to bring ideas that people can share and engage in public space. And I'm using unorthodox materials to begin this dialogue to 
And so that's the work that I'm doing, uh, especially working with forces of nature like wind and showing a way of being in the world that is about harmony with nature and letting the forces of nature be the change and the constant evolution of the artwork. Stunning. Thank you. And I know we'll, we'll hear more about the artworks in our, as we go through the discussion. Alejandro, we'd love to hear a little about your background, please. Uh, hey, hello. Yes, I'm Alejandro Valega. I'm a philosopher. I was born in Latin America and I, I studied in Europe. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, I am a, a philosopher again, born in Latin America. I studied in Europe. Uh, um, I have written several books and published uh, many essays. I, I work basically on aesthetics, on the relationship between uh, aesthetics and the transformation of consciousness in contemporary uh, thought particularly in the sense of also in the sense of what is called decolonial thought, which is a way of thinking aesthetically that goes beyond the Western tradition, both North American and European. Fantastic. Fantastic. What a, glo what a global perspective we have today. It's just, it's wonderful to, to gather together and have this, interesting topic, which uh, those of us who've been working in art, even for a, a shorter period of time, for many years, having the, the blending of ideas, I think is, is really um, a remarkable opportunity. So thank you all. We will move on to our first question, which is, how has the era of post-war contemporary art evolved, in your opinion? And this time I'll start with Julian, please. Okay, I thought you might, since I'm the historian here. Uh, and it's a huge <laughs> question. Uh, it looks very different from different parts of the world, of course. But simplify a lot, it falls into four big periods, I think. The Cold War dichotomy between socialist realism and the various forms of art in the West, boosted to demonstrate uh, creative freedom. And this settled into a sort of postmodern smorgasbord in which, so we were told, hierarchies, hierarchies had evaporated and nothing was disallowed. After 1989 and the collapse of the Eastern uh, Bloc, uh, a remarkable process of globalization took place in which many diverse voices came to the fore, especially in biennials. So that was the second period in a sense. And then from 2001 onwards, another, as the war on terror unfolded, the fraying of postmodernism as um, uh, started as global grand narratives appeared against expectations, against along with a revamped imperialism, and much artwork, especially documentary in this way, which opposed that imperialism. And then finally, from 2008 onwards, um, many, there were many artistic responses to the crisis in capitalism and the desperate attempts of states to keep it afloat. Uh, to take just one example, Stefan Chow and Lin Hui Yi um, make photographs of the food that the legal minimum daily wage will buy you in a large selection of nations around the world. Wow. And what, and what, uh, if I may ask, what, how did this, how did this resonate with you as a professor and with your students, Julian? Oh, you're muted, I believe. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, I, I saw this in the show in which I was participating as a photographer called Capitalist Realism, which was um, a very nice show put together as part of the Thessaloniki um, photo biennial and looked at all kinds of artistic and photographic responses to, uh, you know, the post-2008 era. Okay. Well, I, lo I look forward to seeing that uh, after, after our talk. Or if you have anything that you want to share with the group, of course, we'd love to see that live. Okay, thank you. And Sungi, so as, as our, I believe, no offense to anyone on the panel, as our youngest member, how, how does this question resonate with you? Well, um, 
in the second half of the 20th century when um, um, when uh, <laughs> sorry when uh, after after World War II and and many uh, countries in Africa were being decolonized um, artists uh, were freer to revisit freer their to old artistic practices, artistic practices and there were artistic movements like Tinga Tinga by Tinga. Tinga. Um, Edward Tinga Tinga and he's be he, he's believed to be inspired by tribal wall paintings from the his Makua tribe from the south of Tanzania. Um, also, fo following independence of many countries, especially in the Eastern African region, there was a, a rise of uh, tourism, and there was a lot of, of work being created um, for the, for that market. Uh, and this included, uh, and still includes, a lot of wildlife um, realistic scenes um, depicting the scenarios that uh, tourists would encounter. And, and these paintings would would be souvenirs for yeah for the, for them um, yeah for the, yeah but uh, today with the advancement of the digital age and uh, social media um, artists have a, a wide range of um, um, inspiration uh, and market as well um, so they are they are creating more freely. Uh, because there, there is um, hope for an audience who that can resonate with their work. Wonderful. So yes, the advent of social media, it is new and certainly something that society will continue to contend with and will evolve. And uh, thank you for bringing that up because it certainly is affecting all of our lives and the impact continues to, to shift and, and, um, we'll see. We'll see. You know what's what are rising trends from that. And Janet, if you could please share your your perspective on this question, please. Um, I would like to build on what Julian was saying um, about the internationalization and globalization and biennials. And, and Julian, you've been talking about the. The realization of our interconnectedness, realization of all the world. Uh, somebody, if you could go on mute, thanks. Um, so my work changed dramatically as I was trying to make sense of this interconnectedness of myself and the rest of the world with a commission for a biennial and looking at data sets and not being able to make sense of it. Then starting to work with data sets to turn this into this. And this has become a global project traveling around the world uh, from the United States to Australia, Sydney, Amsterdam, Singapore, Prague, Shanghai, uh, Santiago, Chile, Montreal. This idea of trying to grapple with how we as human beings in specific locations and cultures and countries are interrelated with each other. And how do we make sense of our world in this new era of science and data collection and turn that into interconnectedness? So that is my, uh, and social media becoming a part of that. I may ask a question, Janet. So, how did the, yes. how do your audience. Yes. Yes. So I have a question for you, Janet. Please. So the audience is you. You reach. You're reaching. You're reaching people all over the world with your with your public works of art. And do you yes. do you feel that there is a global visceral understanding of the meaning, or, or do you have what kind of feedback do you get from your audiences? Is it is that too broad of a question to to answer easily? No, um, I think that the works function on multiple levels. So in the first level, you don't need to know anything. This I'm not is sure if London you can hear the question. 
I did hear the question, how do people understand these words? And I think they, they understand them the most. Can you hear me? Um, they hear, they understand them on multiple levels. And um, yes, you, you understand a sense of interconnectedness when you see a piece of work that is changing with the wind. And in this London, people are actually using their smartphones to change the color of the work. Uh, and here people are, are interacting. So sometimes people just experience it as a physical uh, work that is in harmony with nature. And then as they learn more, they understand that the work is also about our planet and human interaction with our planet. These very concrete data sets that happen to look very abstract. So does that help to answer the Lovely. question? Thank you. Um, and now, yes, it does. Thank you so much. And if I could please ask Alejandro uh, how, how this question resonates uh, from your perspective, please, Alejandro. Uh, yes. Uh, I as Julian said, this is a huge uh, yes. question. I just have one uh, one uh, um, observation to make, and it's that, well, you know, I think back to uh, the last thing that Paul Celan wrote before he committed suicide in Paris, which was a sentence, and he said, poetry no longer imposes it, itself, it exposes itself. I think that marks a, trans uh, a transformation of the idea of the work of art from an idea that has to do with representation and the pleasing the eye to an engagement with the, mat with the materials and the concrete situation in which the works of art are being made. I think that this is the fundamental shift that I see in the 20th century. Um, yes. Lovely, lovely. And Nick, how how would you like to respond to the question? Sure, I think uh, there's some feedback, Judy. Um, I think you're, if you mute, then it will be clearer all around. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to say, I think my, my focus for the, for the way it's developed since the war, I think it pop art, um, I think it, it symbolizes a lot of the changes that have gone on in society with technology at the heart of it it's um in a very general sense it's a speeding up of the world but it's also a speeding up of the process for the artist so for example andy warhol linking in with the globalization um is producing things at a rapid rate um intentionally to to sort of symbolize that really um, and I think that's the trage trajectory that I would look to, to to take us up to where we are today and where we might head to in the future. It's, a, it's to do with speeding up. And, you know, a, a, as we've mentioned, social media is becoming more and more prominent. Um, I think traditionally we're used to looking at art in a room for potentially hours. Um, you could argue that today most art is seen for a matter of seconds on an Instagram feed. And um, that surely has had an effect on the way art is made. Um, so, yeah, I think there's been a, a real shift over the last 60, 70 years, especially in the last 10. And um, it'd be interesting to see where we go from here. So, Oh, Judy, I think you're still on mute. Judy, if you click the little red microphone, there Does you that go. Work? No, Good. here we go. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, there's just a, like a lot of things on my on my screen here. So, Nick, besides Andy Warhol, is there anyone else, perhaps more recent, that you think maybe exemplifies uh, your point of view? Um, I think it's a case of being um, 
clear with with what we're talking about. It's um, Olaf Eilerson, I would say, is quite interesting in terms of just simply displaying um, our reality. You know, bringing ice, you know, chunks of ice from the Arctic and just putting them there for people to experience. Um, it, it's yeah. I'm, the, I, if you're looking at Instagram as well as a feature, then um, Yayoi Kusama is quite interesting because people almost I'm, I don't want to say reduce it to, but it's sometimes featuring as a, a background on an Instagram profile. And, and I think that's what prompts a lot of people to go and see this art. So that, maybe that's a bit cynical because the art has got a lot of value in itself when you go and see it. But um, I think this stuff is all having a massive effect. Um, obviously, art is bigger than ever. There's more artists. There's more people that are looking at art. Um and obviously, that's a lot to do with the technology. So it's going to be interesting to see how art is made in response or is being made. Can I just say something? Um, I, I think that what uh, Nick's okay. saying is very Thank right. You. And yeah, is that all right? Uh, just, just quickly to say that I think even artists who are quite resistant to social media, once they get you know, put into a big museum and exposed to the public, um, very often their work becomes Instagrammable whether they like it or not. Okay, thank you. That was, that was really interesting and very diverse, uh, rich in terms of the points that you made. Uh, well done. So our second question, please, for the panelists, uh, relates to the avant-garde historic propensity, I would say, for, for many artists and other cultural creatives, it's maybe a sensibility and, and intuition, a, just this, this ability to connect with, with what the world means maybe more quickly than, than many other people. So how do you feel that uh, what urgent social, myth, social messages that we face today and what are artists and other creatives doing how are they leading the conversation and now i'd like to um, speak with senge please first hi yeah so um when i started making art it was a hundred percent clay uh, but later i came to understand the significance um, of the role of the artist in influencing their community and I'm learning to incorporate um, issues that I'm very passionate about into my work. And uh, yeah, well, one of the social issues that um, I'm very passionate about is gender equality. And there's, um, in East Africa, there's still a lot of gender inequality. And uh, by choosing to, to paint women, it's my, it's my way of activism. I'm, I'm giving them I'm giving these women form and therefore power and importance, and it's in my way. It's, it's my way of empowering them. Um, an, an example of an art, another artist that um, uh, uh, comments on social issues is Pedro Alatise from Nigeria. Um, she she also comments on uh, social issues around um, young girls and women. Um, in a hyperpatriarchal Nigeria, and in her recent sculpture installations, she she drapes fabric over invisible bodies to 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 put up the theme of uh, absence, which is which has been present uh, hanging over the country um, since 2014, when hundreds of young girls were kept kidnapped by the militant group uh, Boko Haram. Um, uh, another example is um, Mary Sibande, a South African um, scul um, sculpture and um, and photographer. She 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 creates sculptures sculptures in um, uh, one of her body of work. She creates. Um, an alter ego, a sculpture of her, of her alter ego called Sophie, and Sophie is uh, is dressed in a in a blue um, a blue dress that's a merge of uh, a domestic worker's dress and a grand Victorian gown. And 
um, in her own way, she's um, she's inspiring um, women like herself to to dream, and she's challenging the stereotypes uh, placed on black women. Thank you, Sungi. That was really such a vivid depiction of of your work and some of your some of your fellow artists. And indeed, the the experience that you must be living in Africa is 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 so different from from certainly some more Western and more uh, some of the countries where the rest of us are living. And having having stories about what you're experiencing and your inspirations are really it's really powerful. So thank you and. Uh, again, I've looked at your work, of course, online, and I, I can't wait to see what you continue to do. So thank you. Janet, I'd love for you to elaborate on, on the question from your perspective, please. Um, I will, again, use images uh, as part of my way of sharing. Um, I think um, I am talking about these, one moment, um, oops. Um, these ideas of humans in relation to each other in terms of our culture and uh, trying to improve equity and justice and our relationship with the world. And I'm trying to invite people to be part of it. This is a project in Vancouver uh, where I collaborated with computer scientists to create a way for people to use their mobile phones to express their interactions with others in live time. So it's both a virtual and a physical experience at the same time. And then uh, dealing with culture, and in particular, a history of racial injustice. This was the site in the United States on the coast of Florida that I was given for a new work. And I discovered this history that it had been the site of swim-ins to protest segregation. And it led to the Supreme Court ruling that forced cities around the country to integrate. And uh, finding that I created a work called Bending Arc that uh, makes uh, a statement to look at the arc, the moral arc, of history and to remind us to dwell on that. And during the Black Lives Matter movement, the sculpture has become a destination for people to gather and tell stories every week. Um, and so this idea of art bringing us together to think, to engage, and to create change. I think that is an important part of the post-war era from my perspective. That's absolutely beautiful. Uh, the swimming, we, we talked about that in an earlier conversation, and it's, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful image. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and now I'd like to ask Alejandro what, uh, what his perspective is. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to have to collaborate with Janet because what I'm going to say is so well illustrated or or my words are somehow justified, I would say, by Janet's work. Um, I think that there is a decisive time to which artists are responding and it's a transformation of consciousness. And it's from an ego lo ecological being that has to do with ego, right? And so I, by ecological mean, I mean, I mean a modern project center around autonomous individuals, rationalist, subjective, consciousness, and will. And the whole predication of freedom and the future of humanity based on that individual subjectivity. I think that there's a shift from that to what I call ecological relational consciousness. And this is something that transcends the human-centered rational, uh, rationalist system right, of production, and actually begins to, uh, again, expose us through the art to relations that are already there and that are beyond the human possibility of causality and the logic of 
only human created things, I would say, right? So there is a way, I think, in which artists are, are uh, expressing this transformation. And I find it fascinating the many ways in which this is happening. Thank you, Alejandro. Really, uh, from a philosopher and professorial point of view, it's, it's, it's just such a deep and rich topic that we're discussing. I wish we had hours. Okay, Nick, um, what are your thoughts on the question, please? Um, so the urgent issues I see are the extent, uh, existential threats of um, AI and climate change. And I think it's the interrelated, I think, technology and the environment. Um, because every advancement with technology seems to come at the expense of nature and the environment. From the, the, if you look at your mobile phone, it's full of uh, lots of different elements, gold, lead, all sorts of different um, materials have gone in to make that mobile phone. The life of it is about 10 years, and then it's very hard to recycle that thing. Um, but we go on and on. There's not really going to be an end I don't think to the, the technological progress, if you like. So as artists, I think we have to explore that. Um, and I think nature is obviously in, involved as well. So I'm thinking of um, an artwork I saw called uh, Feedlots by Mishka Henna. Um, and it's simply um, satellite images, Google Earth images of huge cattle, industrial cattle farms, um, and the runoff and all the different colours of the chemicals that are used and the blood um, from the sky. And it, 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 there's an honesty to that. So like I was saying with Olafur Elias, and it, it's just simply showing what we're doing in nature. Um, there's no other motive or anything with it. There's nothing added. It's just an image from the sky. Um, and so I think that's powerful, that, that kind of thing. Um, I, I do think that the the issues that are facing us are massive uh almost very crippling in terms of the um creativity aspect um it's overwhelming but at the same time as artists we should find that inspiring that we could actually do something to communicate this to people uh, so in a way it's the biggest source of inspiration that we could hope for um it's uh, with technology, it reminds me of um, U2 and their song, you know, with or without you. Uh, we, you know, we can't live with the technology, but we, we can't live without it. We, oh, sorry, we can't live with it and we can't live without it. So it's um, it's one of those things. We're in a double bind, but it, as artists, I feel like we're right on the, the front edge of, of um, changing our direction if we can do that. Um, and we have to try to, to find it together. Beautifully said, um, and Bono is one of the masters of, of being in, up in front of, of social change, so great analogy. Uh, Julian, what are your thoughts, please? Uh, thanks. I mean, there are indeed many issues, and I agree with what, much of what's been said. Uh, for me, there are two really big ones. I guess uh, the first is the linked issue of widening precarity, um, weakened states and political polarization. And the second, of course, is the environmental catastrophe that threatens, to over, uh, uh, threatens us all. The first one is quite hard to visualize in some ways, but there are plenty of documentary and activist responses. Um, one might think of last year when the Brazilian artist Julio Vlani, in a guerrilla action, hung six black cloths on the facade of the Brazilian embassy in Paris protest at Bolsonaro's COVID and other policies. And those cloths reflected those hung uh, by people in Brazil at balconies and windows, signs of grief and protest. Or in a very different way, think of the uh, photo book by Paolo Woods and Gabriele uh, Galimberti. It's called The Heavens Annual Report from 2015. And it's a photo book which gives visual and coherent form to global tax havens to their residents, to the institutions, and the visions of an ideal insulated luxury life uh, that they offer, uh, along with a few of the consequences for the rest of us. And on the environment, um, I just want to point to one hopeful thing, I guess, which is an example of successful action. Uh, our our um, Liberate Tate, which in a six-year campaign of performative protest, forced the Tate to abandon its alliance with the oil company BP. Um, one of the reasons this 
these actions were effective was because it was hard for the Tate to be seen to repress and police artists as they invaded its galleries to make art. One of their actions was bringing in a massive um, wind turbine blade as a donation to Tate's collection. So those are the two. I think. Thank you. Yes, the, the, the activism on the part of actual artists is something that really is making change, making, making direct change. We see, it, uh, we see it a lot. Although I'm in Europe, you know I'm close to the United States, my home country. It, in New York, there's been massive institutional changes, and it's, it's tipping point, tipping point in my, in my humble opinion. Okay, just a quick time check. We have a total of 10 minutes left. So this third and final question before closing, um, let's try to keep each, each of your thoughts to about a minute, okay? Um, because I, I think that the video literally stops. So we, even if we wanna keep talking, we do wanna try and get through. Okay, and based on these two first preliminary questions, uh, for those of us less familiar with the, the spectrum of the art history eras, uh, one, many, many, many systems believe that sort of post-World War II until now is this, this umbrella called post-war contemporary art. Each one of you, in a minute or less, is, is it time for a new actual institutionalized name? And, and what would you like that to be? And I am going to start with Janet. There you go. Um, I see this as a radical new era of radical interconnectedness. And I am working in every way I can to bring about and remind us of ways that we are interconnected with one another and interconnected with our planet. Uh, interconnected with the forces around us that we don't see, like wind, and interconnected with uh, our fellow human beings around the world. This is, I'm sharing just one artwork. This is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle, and uh, where I'm projecting sunrise as it begins in each of their uh, offices around the world onto the sculpture in uh, their home to remind all of us as we act uh, both locally and globally of our interconnectedness with one another. Janet, uh, that was absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to see all of these. I want to see all of your works live. So I'll be traveling around in your suitcase with you. Alejandro, Thank you. I'd love to hear you. Uh, yes, uh, I would say that I, I think that naming things is perhaps one of the weaknesses that we have as humans uh, I, uh, in the sense that we, I think, insist on defining things uh, always at a point which is too early and too late. I would remain with something, perhaps a word that would indicate uh, the crisis uh, that we're living and this would be a kind of transhumanism. And the reason why I'm calling it transhumanism is because I think that um, there are several aspects which uh, lead us to have to abandon, as I was saying before, this subjective consciousness <clears throat> and single rationalism that's very Western. For example, the pandemia shows us that our bodies are not autonomous and separate from everybody else. Single party individual political representation has collapsed. And instead of that, we have the the... Sardines in Italy, the Green Vest in France, which are movements, political movements that don't have a, a party as a center. Um, artificial intelligence has a, 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 a is weighted by opacity, which certainly transcends the, what we expect to be knowledge through algorithms. Right? The environmental disaster cannot be controlled by uh, single individuals or even governments. Right? And ultimately, I think that the development of decolonial thought has decentered the idea of any single form of thought and rather led to a purification of ways of knowledge. So I would say that transhuman and transmodern would be good words for indicating some of the uh, transformative elements in the crisis that artists are dealing with.
Wow. Great, great, great words. So I'm writing and trying to <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Nick, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I absolutely think we are in a new era. Um, it's um, it, it's it's massive, really, because um, we're handing over control. I think now um, to algorithms. Um, a lot of people speculate about when this will happen in the future, but I think it's already happened. Um, a lot of us work for technology. Technology doesn't always work for us. Uh, so I think a lot of us are trying to please algorithms and 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 see that as a way of, of advancing our lives but actually it might not be the best way to go about it i don't necessarily have a solution for what, what will be the best way um i think movements like extinction rebellion are quite interesting um as a resistance um refocusing on on what's important for us and what's going to sustain us as humans sustain the planet sustain animals wildlife um finding out what what's what we are who we are what's important to us uh, so far we're so wrapped up in technology that we can't see anything um but it's also the solution in some ways as well it, um i mean look at the vaccine it's got us out of a hole possibly that we got ourselves into um but absolutely it's a new era uh, i agree with alejandro it's naming it is difficult um it's something to do with systems and algorithm but artists, as they are, are maybe going to hand over to algorithms to create art. So that's another aspect, another hurdle to, to kind of get over. But, uh, yeah, so it's I, I don't want to end in a too bleak. Don't be so tortured. Anyway, I think it's great that we're talking about this stuff because that is yeah. how we, we come to the solutions. Thank you. Thank you. I would engage in a dialogue that we as artists need to take technology and use it for our humanist goals and that we are not powerless with respect to technology and that the history of human beings with artists is has been to take new technologies and to use it. So uh, I see it as a challenge, Nick. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Julian. Okay, I'll, I'll try and be really brief. Uh, I've made the mistake of, uh, of naming uh, a tendency in contemporary art, uh, which is very much about the kind of thing that um, Alandro was complaining about, this sort of uh, ultra-hierarchical, uh, will-driven, ultra-individualistic, uh, individualistic, expensive, gargantuan, PR-driven art, which I've called populist art. Uh, and I think it's a sort of median ideology behind this which is uh, it's art made by and it courts those who think of themselves as exceptional the wolves above the above the sheep and that art is a very telling symptom of a planet headed for catastrophe um but i think uh, like nick and some of the others here i'm also very interested in extinction rebellion in the idea that um it ties up enjoyment and protest and dissidence uh, and even insurgency in really interesting aesthetic ways, uh, which, you know, aligning aesthetics and politics. Uh, I don't think that tendency has an art world name yet, and maybe it doesn't need one. Okay, Sungi. And this will be, we're just going to go quickly around one sentence. Go, Sungi. What do you think about this? Uh, yeah, if, if we define contemporary art as simply art of today, um, uh, I like that contemporary is, is difficult to define and I wouldn't want, want to define a new era because um, uh, the difficulty in defining things shows um, that there's so much artistic freedom um, present at the moment. Yeah. Everyone, one sentence. We're gonna, it's gonna shut down in a minute. So, sorry guys. <laughs> let's start with, let's start with Alejandro. Uh, my sentence would be yes to everything. <laughs> no. uh, yep, to say, uh, Janet, I do agree with you on that. There's um, The technology can really be the solution as well. And I, I think these things, they give us new tools to, to, find, to come up with these solutions. So hopefully we'll get them. Brilliant. Um, just engage and activate your writing, art, whatever it is that you do. Sungi. Let's be free. 
Janet. Era of radical interconnectedness. <laughs> so, oh, we just got a message. The time has elapsed. You can stay as long as you want. <laughs> All right, we get one last round. I'd like everyone, please. Oh, uh, we'd like someone to share the mic. We're going to say, okay, go for it, Rohan. Is this how I do it? Can you speak? I think this is correct. Are you on, Rohan? Maybe write a chat. I don't know if that's coming through. I'm sorry. Well, in the meantime, we're going to keep talking. And uh, now that we've all really heard everyone else's perspectives, um, it doesn't seem there's a clear consensus.